Hey, glad to be here with you all. You hear me? Yeah, I think that's all good. Um, I didn't get, I'm not going to get to tell you the story of that one we just sang. Do you all know anything about that hymn we just sang? Um, it had a lot of verses, didn't it? It actually has like 26 verses. Um, so we only sang some of them. But I felt like we just watched a, a video about the Highland Games and the Scots. So I should tell you something about that hymn. It was uh, based on the letters of a guy named Samuel Rutherford. Samuel Rutherford was one of the Scottish uh, pastors who helped write the Westminster uh, Shorter Catechism, Larger Catechism, and the Westminster um, Confession. So maybe you've heard of that here. Maybe? Yeah. Don't, don't make me go report to the PCA. You don't know what that is, right? <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. Anyway, um, he basically got exiled because of his opposition to the government telling him you know, how to pastor and, and what he could believe and how, all various religious kind of controversies. Um, he was quite critical of the government and particularly the king claiming to be um, appointed by God. Uh, he was a thorough Presbyterian. And he was imprisoned in a place called Black Rock. Um, and in this prison, he wrote letters to his flock, to his people. A lady named Ann Cousins in the 19th century took those letters and turned it into this 26 verse poem, and that hymn is taken from that. So it, actually, I think on the Indelible Grace hymn book website, I think I have the full 26 uh, verses. It's really great. I uh, encourage you to, 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 to check that out. But also that line, I see glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's line. That was what he said on his deathbed. He was asked how it was with his soul as he was passing from this life to the next, and he said, I see glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. So it's a cool story. And I commend to you the letters of Samuel Rutherford, wonderful devotional reading. Um, but today we're going to talk about something else. If you have a Bible or you can uh, get a Bible on your phone, if you want to turn Galatians chapter 4, I'm going to read this passage. This is for me, this is the passage that I always um, speak from if I'm involved in somebody's ordination service. And, and I thought it might be good. We've got a lot of people nearing graduation Others that are, you know, still here kind of figuring out what does God want me to do? How then shall I live? This is a passage I think is so helpful for that. But it's a passage about groaning as in the pains of childbirth. It might seem a strange passage to pick for somebody about to go into ministry or somebody about to be launched off into college. Maybe you expected that the groaning <laughs> would be over when finals are over for the last time. Uh, but I would submit to you that if love is part of your vocation, groaning will inevitably be part of your experience. And that's not strange. That's the way it works in this fallen world. So let's read, um, follow along as I read from Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to start with verse 12. The Apostle Paul writes this, I plead with you, brethren, become like me, for I became like you. You've done me no wrong. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. What has happened to all your joy? I can testify that if you could have done so, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. Have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? Those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. What they want is to alienate you from us so that you may be zealous for them. It's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always and not just when I am with you. With you. My dear children, for whom I am again in the pains of childbirth until Christ is formed in you, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Let me pray. Lord, thank you so much that this portion of God's word is so honest and vulnerable that the Apostle Paul would confess that he's perplexed and doesn't know what to do. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand and even to embrace that calling 
where it rings true even in our own lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Groaning as in the pains of childbirth. What an image. That, uh, that was a, that, that's a, well, it's a difficult image now. But imagine in Paul's day what that was like. Now, I'll tell you this story. This is one of my favorite stories about Cooper, though he doesn't remember this, of course. But my wife, Wendy, who's here, she had two C-sections where the anesthesia didn't work. And the first time, like, they pricked her belly, and it seemed like everything was fine until they cut deeper. And then she was like, that's not working. Now, our, our doctor... Our doctor was on his way leaving the hospital where we were having this birth, and he was going to go to another hospital, so he actually said, it's fine for me to videotape this uh, C-section, which was totally against the rules. Um, But because of that, I can't deny what I said because it's on video, okay? So, you know, when you're going to have a baby, like you go to these birthing classes, right? And they're telling you, like, you literally are going to have to learn how to help your wife breathe. And I'm like, oh, gosh, this sounds uh, incredible. Like, but she had a C-section scheduled two weeks ahead of time. Well, for me, that means basically, like, they give her the, the spinal and then they wheel her off. And all I really have to do is put on a gown and, like, scrub in. And then they bring me in there and she's there. Like, as soon as I'm in there, they're like cutting and it really wasn't like anything like I expected as far as like having to help her breathe for like two days or whatever it was that we were going to do and so as they you know as she says well I can feel that I can feel that they you know hurry up and shoot her up with something that kind of made her really woozy she's going in and out of consciousness you can see this on the video they pull Cooper out they set her right next to, to, to her head and you hear me say, as Wendy's like, you can look at her eyes, like drifting in and out of consciousness. I'm like, well, that wasn't so bad, was it, honey? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, even in our day of modern medicine, it's not a pleasant image, right? It's a very strong image. But here's what I want you to understand. We know this, that life is full of suffering. As a matter of fact, Paul says to them that the reason he preached to them in the first place was because of an illness. Probably had something to do with his eyes. We don't know for sure. But he never intended to even stop off there. He got waylaid there. And God used even that to bring the gospel to this church. But the suffering he's talking about in our text today, what really made his heart ache was to a large degree self-induced. In other words, he's groaning to see Christ formed in them, and he won't back down. In fact, I believe we have the letter of the Galatians precisely because Paul doesn't back down in his groaning for Christ to be formed in them. And I don't know about you, but that really challenges me. Because I think so many of us take the path of least resistance in our relationships. We say to one another, whether implicitly or explicitly, don't challenge my sin and I won't challenge yours. We make little deals like this all the time in relationships, even in marriages, roommate relationships, whatever. But Paul refuses to take the path of least resistance. Why? Because his goal for them is so much bigger than the goal that the false teachers have. See, Paul aches to see Christ formed in the Galatians. The false teachers, it says in verse 17, they just want zealous followers. And no wonder. Because if they're believing the quote-unquote gospel that they're teaching these Galatians, one thing we know, it must have made the false teachers terribly insecure. And how do we know that? Well, because that's what it did to the Galatians. It's what it did to the Galatians. See, they've lost their joy that they had when they first understood the gospel of grace. And in verse 16, he says, have I now become your enemy by telling you the truth? In other words, their great love where they would have torn out their eyes and given them to him if they could has now turned to defensiveness and hatred. As I said, when they first heard the gospel of grace, it was so different 
The gospel of grace had produced in them astonishing love and sacrifice. Look what he says in verse 13. As you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. And even though my illness was a trial to you, you did not treat me with contempt or scorn. Instead, look at this, you welcomed me as if I were an angel of God, as if I were Christ Jesus himself. When the gospel of grace changed their lives, they treated Paul in his illness like he was Jesus himself. And it says that you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me if you could have. But what happened? Well, they bought into a false gospel. And what you need to understand is whatever quote-unquote gospel you believe, it always has an impact on your relationships. It always impacts the way you love others. They have turned against Paul because he had the audacity to suggest that all was not well. Have you ever done that to someone? They think he's their enemy. But in reality, his misery is because of his great love for them. See, when the gospel is not our security, we will always become touchy and we will never be able to handle criticism. But look at what Paul models, something very different. He groans for Christ to be formed in them, speaks of his goal, but he stays in this relationship even though he doesn't know what to do. Oh, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Where he says in verse 20, how I wish I could be with you now and change my tone because I am perplexed about you. Isn't that amazing? Paul, the apostle, responsible for more of the New Testament than any other person, writes this letter telling people, I don't know what to do. And let me tell you, if you actually begin trying to love people, really love people, I suspect you will bump up against this all the time. I tell people the call to ministry is a call to groaning and being perplexed. It really is. When I went off to seminary, I thought I was going to learn all the answers. (laughs) You know, maybe that's why you came to Covenant. It's a good place to learn a lot of good answers, good stuff. But when you actually begin to love and deal with real people, And real relationships in this world of brokenness and sinners, you will find that ministry is about groaning and being perplexed. Now, you see, Paul, as I said, had preached the gospel to the Galatians. Amazing fruit had happened. Revival had broken out. And then he left. And the reason we have the letter to the Galatians is because after he left... Some false teachers came in and said, well, you know, grace was fine for beginning your relationship with God, but if you really want God to love you, well, then you need to do all these other things. Good things, but you need to do all these other things. And it, it, it really made them not, uh, well, it made them terribly insecure. They lost their joy, and they began to believe that Paul was their enemy. Now, what you need to understand is Paul is not there. He had to have heard about what happened, and he writes a letter because he's perplexed and he doesn't know what to do. Now, I think what's interesting is Paul had all kinds of things that he could have been doing. But he doesn't say, you know, you guys really don't appreciate the sacrifices and the way God used me in your life. I think I'm going to go over here where they really appreciate me and my gifts. Right? But he doesn't do that. He stays in the relationship even though he doesn't want, know what to do. I I don't think we do that very much. I think there are two main reasons we don't groan for people like we should. The first is we value comfort more than God's kingdom. I'm preaching to myself here, which my wife will affirm. In other words, our goal is too small. So we check out and go through the motions adopt an attitude, sometimes of professional detachment. We value comfort more than the God's kingdom. That's one of the reasons that we fail to groan for people. But also, I think the second reason, we want people's approval 
more than we long for Christ to be formed in them, which is to say our love is too weak and so we're content with followers and bigger numbers. But here's the point. If we're seeking worshipers, we will never confront people. But if you're seeking for Christ to be formed in people, then you have to confront them. But the real question is where will you find the courage to do that? David Jones, one of my favorite professors at Covenant Seminary, um, used to say the real problem of the Christian life is not so much figuring out what to do, it's finding the courage to do it. Where will we find the courage? How can we be free from our lust for people just to like us Because I would say you don't really love someone unless you're groaning for Christ to be formed in them. Unless you're willing to sacrifice your own comfort to see Christ formed in them. Even if it means you're perplexed all the time. Because neither our comfort or their comfort can ever be the goal. And if it is, I would go so far as to say we're probably working at cross purposes from God. Ministry is about groaning and being Perplex. I think one of the ways I learned this was when I was in seminary. Back in Covenant Seminary in the 80s, you actually didn't have to take any practical ministry classes other than preaching. It's way different now um, and better, I think. But there was one class that a senior, when I came in, told me I had to take. And it was a hospital counseling class with a guy named Seth Dearness. Seth has passed on now. But what this class was, you basically would go over to Missouri Baptist Hospital. You would get like a little piece of paper that would have like 10 patients, their name, their room number, and their age. And then their condition like on a one to five scale. But no other information really about what was going on with them. And you would basically spend about two hours going out on the floor. You'd knock on the door and ask if they wanted a visit from a chaplain. And if they said yes, then you could go in and just chat with them. And then we'd come back together uh, in the chaplain's office and we'd debrief, right? Well, one time I get this little slip and I go to the first room I go to and their door is open, but I can see the woman, older woman, is sitting in a chair next to her bed all the way across the room. And, And I do the normal thing. I knock on the door and I say, would you like a visit from a chaplain? And she looks at me kind of perplexed and starts to get a little agitated. So I'm thinking, well, maybe she didn't hear me. So I say it a little louder as I begin to step across the threshold of the door into the room, and as I begin to do that, she begins to to really freak out. And I, I say it one more time, and at this point, she's screaming. And I turn around, and I hightailed it out of there. And I remember I went back down to the chaplain's office, and you know what Seth said to me? He goes, Kevin, How do you think you could have ministered to this woman without her being able to understand what you were trying to say? Because it seemed obvious that she didn't have the ability to understand what I was saying. He said, look, I don't know if this would have worked, but perhaps you could have knelt in front of her and taken her hand gently. I'm like, what? Like, I went to seminary to learn the words to say. (laughs) But my issues, perhaps, got in the way right? How can I minister to someone if I, if, I can't, if I can't speak to them, right? What kind of ministry are we preparing for? Well, here's what I would say. I think we're only going to be free, free to love like that when we hear the one who's groaning for us. It's important that we remember that Paul is not just some guy writing a letter, about conflict. He is an apostle speaking on God's behalf. He's very clear about that in this letter in particular. And what's interesting is this is not the first time in the Bible this image of groaning as in the pain of childbirth shows up. It's not just Paul who's groaning. God himself speaks about groaning. Isaiah chapter 63, sorry, Isaiah chapter 42. For a long time, I have kept silent. I have been quiet and held myself back, but now like a woman in childbirth, I cry out, I gasp and pant. Isaiah 63, nine, for uh, in all their distress, he too was 
distressed. Do you think of God as someone who is groaning? Or do you think Paul is the only one groaning? I would submit to you that God is groaning until all things are made right and he's not going to be back down until Christ is formed in us. In other words, it's one of the ways you can understand what the cross was all about. Christ endured the agony of the cross and never backed down. And Paul had heard Jesus say to him after his resurrection, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And if you don't believe that, Paul says in Romans 8.26 that the Holy Spirit is groaning. So it seems that Paul is quite convinced. Father, Son, Holy Spirit are groaning until all things are made right. This is so important because when God brings trials into our lives, do we hear him groaning for us or do we think that maybe he is our enemy? We think it might be better that God would leave us alone, but of course in the scripture for God to give you over to your sin and leave you alone is a terrible judgment. God disciplines those he loves his children, Hebrews says in chapter 12. And my prayer is that you embark on the life that God has for you, that you would learn to groan with God rather than groaning about what he's doing in our lives. As I said, I think we refuse to groan for others because we're so addicted to our own comfort and the approval of others, but Christ gave up his comfort and his father's approval because he refused to quit groaning. And why? We're so petty and ungrateful. We give up on people as soon as they annoy us, never mind how they treat us, or we treat them if they betray us, yet we betray Christ every minute of the day, and God is still groaning. You know, what's amazing is that God is the one person who could end his groaning if he wanted to, either by wiping us off the planet or by making us perfect in an instant, and he doesn't. Why? I don't know then I could never worship a God I could figure out. Could you? See, pregnancy, knowing that you're headed for excruciating pain, has got to be a weird experience. When you're in the throes of labor pains, all that matters is that it ends, and soon. We like to, we hate to groan, we hate being perplexed, but consider this. Jesus knew from all eternity he was headed to the cross. It was always on his mind. And after the resurrection, he so identifies with his people and his suffering, again, that he says to Paul, you are persecuting me. And the father says, he's like a woman screaming in labor pains. And the one who's distressed in all our distress until all things are made new. And then, of course, the spirit is groaning, Romans 8. So here's it. Here's this. The whole whole Godhead is groaning until Christ is formed in you. Do you hear it? Do you groan for others? Do you groan for yourself to even want to grow for others? I don't think we'll groan for ourselves for others until we hear that God is groaning for us. See, the church is not just a hospital. It's a maternity ward. Everybody is groaning in labor. My prayer is that we would open our ears, that God would open our ears to hear his groaning. Think about this, if the smile of God, if seeing the smile of God with the eyes of faith brings joy and peace, and it does, what will hearing the groaning of God with the ears of faith bring? I pray that it will engage us in his mission and make his concerns our concerns. If you hear God's groaning, Will it draw you into the things that he cares about? The call to ministry, you see, is a call to groaning and being perplexed. And that's okay if we believe God is at work. It's actually a disaster if you think it's your competence that changes people. (laughs) That hits me where I live because my issues still get in the way. I still want my comfort more than God's kingdom. But here's what I know. God is groaning for me to be different. And that changes everything. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you.
that you have committed to completing the good work you began. And Lord, we don't understand why you tarry, why, why we still cry, how long, O oh Lord? But Lord, help us to trust you, help us to hear your groaning with the ears of faith, to love the things you love, to hate the things you hate, to groan over the things that make you groan. We ask this in Jesus' name and for the sake of his kingdom. Amen.